Why can't you fly now? Why can't you go into empty space? You have too many burdens. That's why you they weigh you down and make your body very heavy. That is to speak of the Earth's gravitational pull. But if you are free of burdens, then the force of gravity does not bind you, and you can gain your independence. The transient dust burdens us. It is because your burdens pull at you and cling to your clothing that you can no longer fly, although originally you could. However, the good heart can think of ways to enable all living beings to transcend their troublesome burdens, so they can no longer be tied down. So the Earth's gravitational force can no longer hold them. Once free, you can drift off into space like a balloon. You can go wherever you wish, to the moon, to the stars. It is not easy to travel this way. This kind of travel is very convenient. There's no need to buy a plane ticket. Wherever you want to go, you can just go there. If you can reach that level, you are said to have transcended your troublesome burdens. Just as the previous sentence praises the great Aha's virtue of kindness, which brings happiness, this last sentence praises their virtue of compassion, which can rescue living beings from their distress. Sutra, the names of the leaders were the greatly wise Shariputra, Maha Maudgalyana, Maha Kaushila, Pona Maitrayaniputra. Saputi, Upanishad, and others. Commentary Shariputra's name may be translated in three ways. Son of the body, because his mother's body was extremely beautiful. Son of the pelican, because his mother's eyes were as beautiful as a pelican's. And son of jewels, because his mother's eyes shone like jewels. And Shariputra's eyes were like his mother's. Shariputra was foremost in wisdom among the South heroes. In fact, greatly wise Shariputra's wisdom was evident even before he was born. Maha Kaushtela, Shariputra's uncle, used to debate with his sister Sharika. He never had any trouble defeating her until she became pregnant with Shariputra and then he outwitted him every time, realizing that his sister's newly acquired skill in debate must be due to the presence of an exceptional child in her womb. Mahakaushtila set out to school himself in all the dharmas of all the non-Buddhist religions in preparation for the day when he would meet his nephew in debate. He spent many years in southern India pursuing his studies and when he returned to seek out his nephew, he learned that the greatly wise Shariputra had left the home life to follow the Buddha after having defeated all the master debaters from the five parts of India in debate when he was only eight years old. Mahakavushthila was displeased to learn that his nephew was a disciple of the Buddha because he had naturally hoped that after all his years of study and with his unsurpassed debating powers, he would win the respect and loyalty of the child. He decided to challenge the Buddha, proposing that if he won a debate with the Buddha, the Buddha would relinquish Sariputra to him, and just to show his confidence, he blatantly added that he would chop off his head as an offering to the Buddha if he lost the, the debate. Once he went before the Buddha, however, his confidence wavered and he searched frantically through his dramas for a tenet of doctrine to form the basis of this all-important debate. Finally, the Buddha said, Well, speak up, establish your principle, and I will consider your request. Basically, I do not accept any principle, said Kaushtila finally and a bit triumphantly thinking that this would render the Buddha speechless. Oh, replied the Buddha without hesitation, do you accept that position? 
bewildered. Shari put her uncle thought, if I say I don't accept the position of having no position, I will have destroyed my own doctrine and will lose the debate. But if I say I do accept it, my acceptance will be in direct opposition to my basic tenet. Caught in the horns of this dilemma, Kawustela hesitated a fraction of a second and then, without a word, turned on his heels and ran as fast as he could out of the room, out of the Buddha's way place, out of the gardens, and down the road for several miles without stopping. Eventually, he regained some self-control, recalled that he was a man of his word, and realized that he must return to the Buddha and offer him his head. When he arrived, and asked the Buddha for a knife. However, the Buddha explained that in the Buddha Dharma things are not done that way. Then the Buddha spoke Dharma for Mahakavustila and enabled him to open his Dharma eye. Once his Dharma eyes was opened, he could see clearly the fallacies in the dramas of the non-Buddhist paths and he had studied that he had studied so rigorously and he requested permission to leave the home life and follow the Buddha. Mahakaustila's name means big news. Some say his ancestors' kneecaps were big, and some say that Kaustila's own kneecaps were big. In general, large kneecaps were a family trait. Mahakaustila was first among the Buddha's disciple, disciples in debate. Mahamaudgalayana's name means the Kalita tree, because his father and mother prayed, so the spirit of that tree of a for a son. He was foremost among the disciples in spiritual penetrations. Another Sanskrit name means son of fullness and compassion. Purna, which means full, refers to his father's name, which meant fulfilled vows. Mayachayani, which means compassionate woman, was his mother's name. Pujra means son. What was his particular talent? Whereas Rajaputra was foremost in wisdom, and Mahamud Galyayana was foremost in spiritual penetrations. Purna Mayachayani Pujra was foremost in speaking Dharma. No one else could explain the sutras with such a subtlety and in such a deep and moving way. When Purna spoke the sutras, heavenly maidens scattered flowers and golden lotuses welled up from the earth. Whoever would like to be foremost in speaking Dharma can recite Namo Venerable Purna over and over, and Purna will use his wisdom and eloquence to aid you in speaking Dharma so that you will be able to move people. How will they be moved? They want to do the offer when you're lecturing sutras. When Puna spoke drama, no one was able to go to sleep. He expressed the characteristics of all dramas well and so was said to have an obstructed eloquence. Saputi, another of the ten great disciples, was foremost in understanding emptiness. His name has three meanings, born to emptiness, splendid, apparition and good luck. When Saputi was born, all the wealth in his household, all the gold, silver and precious gems disappeared. The treasuries stood empty. No one knew where it had all gone. But since the, 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 the disappearance of the wealth coincided with the birth, the infant was given the name born to emptiness. Seven days after his birth, all the riches reappeared, and so the child was renamed a Splendid Apparition. His parents wanted to find out whether the child was good or bad, so they went to a diviner soon after his birth. In India, there was no book of changes, Yi Ching. Instead, they used the diviner to figure out whether their child was good or bad. He came up with good and lucky, so the child was renamed Good Luck. Saputi was foremost 
in understanding and so the Vana Sutra he is the Buddha's interlocutor locutor. That is it was he who asked Shakyamuni Buddha to explain the doctrine of Prana. Upanishad, also Sanskrit, means thus nature. Upanishad awakened to the way when he saw that the nature of all external objects is fundamentally empty. He awakened to the doctrine of impermanence as it is embodied in the nature of external objects and others means that these six bishops were not the only ones in the assembly. There were at least 1250 disciples in the assembly, but these six held seniority and sat in the highest positions. Thus, they are mentioned by names who represent the assembly of great ahas and great bishops. Sutra, moreover, the meekless pratikas who were beyond learning and those with Initial resolve came to where the Buddha was to join the bishops Bravarana at the close of the summer retreat. Commentary The numberless Pratyekas were the Pratyeka Buddhas who belonged to the great high court of those enlightened conditions, enlightened by conditions. This Vihaiko and the South Hero Vihaiko of the great Ahas mentioned above are often referred to together as the two vehicles. They had reached a level of being beyond learning. Upon attainment of the fourth foot of a hardship, cultivators reached a position of being beyond learning. The term Pratika Buddha can be interpreted as meaning solitary enlightened ones, referring to those who were enlightened by themselves at the time when no Buddha was in the world, but it also has come to refer to those enlightened by conditions. During a time when a Buddha is in the world, those enlightened by conditions follow the Buddha in cultivating the twelve links of conditioned causation and thus awaken to the way the twelve links of conditioned causation are one ignorance which conditions activities, activity which conditions consciousness, consciousness which conditions name and form, Name and form which condition the six sense organs, the six sense organs which condition contact, contact which conditions feeling, feeling which conditions love, love which conditions grasping, grasping which conditions existence, existence which conditions birth, birth which conditions old age and death. When ignorance is extinguished, activity is extinguished. When activity is extinguished, consciousness is extinguished. When consciousness is extinguished, name and form are extinguished. And when name and form are extinguished, contact is extinguished. When contact is extinguished, feeling is extinguished. When feeling is extinguished, love is extinguished. When love is extinguished, grasping is extinguished. When grasping is extinguished, existence is extinguished. When existence is extinguished, birth is extinguished. When birth is extinguished, old age and death are extinguished. Thus, the travelings of conditioned causation can be extinguished. Pratyeka Buddhas who live for the time when a Buddha is in the world are called those enlightened by conditions. Nevertheless, in the Surakama assembly, there were cultivators who are probably called solitary enlightened ones. How can that be? There were searchers who had cultivated the way in the mountains before Shakyamuni Buddha had realized Buddhahood. When there was no Buddha in the world, in the springtime they watched the many flowers blossom. In the autumn they saw the yellow leaves fall. They observed the myriad things with being born and dying and by themselves they were awakened to the way. Then after Shakyamuni Buddha realized Buddhahood, they left their caves in the cracks deep in the mountains and desolate valleys and came forth to help Shakyamuni Buddha propagate the Buddha drama. The meekest numbers of them became part of that influential assembly. Besides Pratika Buddhas who were beyond learning, there was also Pratika Buddhas with initial resolve 
a heart with the initial resolve, ambitious with the initial resolve, who had not yet become mature in the way. All came to where the Buddha was to join the bishops, Bravarana, at the close of a summer retreat. In Buddhism, there is a rule that those who have left the home life must pass the summer in retreat. This rule came about because for a period of 90 days from the 15th of the 4th lunar month to the 15th of the 7th lunar month, the members of the Sangha lived in one place and did not go anywhere. They didn't go traveling or take a vacation. There were two reasons for this. First, the weather was very hot and made for especially uncomfortable traveling. That was particularly true in India. Second, insects and other small creatures are particularly abundant on the earth in summer. To avoid stepping on them and squashing them to death, to nurture compassion for all living beings and to protect them, the bhikshus and bhikshunis and the Buddha lived in one place and did not go out. At the close of the summer retreat refers to the end of the 90-day period of seclusion. During the three-month retreat, people might have committed offenses and broken rules. And so, at the close of the retreat, at the end of the 90 days, it was necessary to hold a communal examination during which everyone was encouraged to confess his offenses frankly. This was the Pravarana. If anyone had committed offenses without realizing it, then others in the assembly were expected to question him and help him see his mistakes. Nothing was held back, and everyone was expected to answer the questions he was asked and to admit his faults without argument. This discussion was carried on in an open, orderly fashion without anyone giving rise to afflictions or becoming angry when his errors and faults were pointed out. In this way, they read each other of their forms. This kind of communal examination was designed to cause people to change their errors and move toward the good. Everything had, that had happened before became a dead issue, and everything that happened from that day onward was, was like a new life. People were encouraged to do things that benefit body and mind and not to do things that do not benefit body and mind.